So let's shift from looking at Excel 2007, which is what we've done like the last five, six videos, and take a look at Excel 2010. Now, one little kind of a preamble, if you will. If you just got through watching the Excel 2007 series, and now you're coming here and you're like, hey, you know, I want to see what's new in Excel 2010, I'll save you some time. Skip this video. Skip the next video. Maybe skip the next video. Uh, about the only thing really that you'd probably want to see, uh, there's really not that much new that we're not going to get into until Power Pivot later, um, is what's called the slicers. So actually go up, I think it's like video 13, uh, 12, 13, 14, in this chapter. I haven't actually recorded it yet, so I'm not quite sure what the number is. But it's about the slicers in Excel 2010 and doing some filtering and things like that. Outside of that, you'll be surprised. Almost everything's the same. Right? Better visualizations, better graphics, but overall, the solid core of Excel 2007, if you know that, you're going to be very comfortable moving forward. Okay, now I'm assuming that I'm talking to just those of you who are on Excel 2010 or want to see what Excel 2010 is all about, but did not watch the 2007 stuff. So let's talk. First thing that we need to understand here is exactly what we're connecting to, what we're going to be working with. So here's, let me see if I can save you a little bit of time. There's going to be a couple of different types of people watching this video. One, those that watched chapters four, five, six, or seven with me already, and those that didn't. If you've watched chapters four, five, six, or seven, and you already know what cubes, dimensions, measures, database, you already know what all of that kind of stuff is. If you haven't, if you've been following the BI analysts, the BI users track with me, then you didn't really watch those. And so you and I need to have maybe a, a refresher on the terms that we're going to be seeing when we start working with this. So let's do that. Let me, um, let me get my little tablet and my pen here. And we're going to walk through and do just a little bit of terminology here. All right. So as a user, as an end user, as the person wanting to run the reports, to view the charts, etc., right, you connect to two things. Okay. You're going to connect one to an SSAS server. Okay. So you have to know the installation, you have to know the IP address or the server name or whatever. You have to know the instance of analysis services that you need to connect to. Okay. And then two, you connect to an SSAS database on that instance. An installation of analysis services is technically called an instance. Now if you only have one analysis services server, you're just going to say, hey, can I connect to the analysis services server? Some people even shorten it by saying, hey, can I connect to the analysis server? Can you give me the analysis server information? There's nothing wrong with that. People would be able to infer, I think, what you meant. Okay? But technically, it's called an instance. So you've got to know the instance name or the address, how you can connect to it. Uh, you'll probably have to get that from your DBA or the database architect or somebody else. And then what's the name of the database on that analysis services instance? that contains the data that you need. Okay, so see, one analysis services server can have n databases. Okay. Now, that's part one of what you need to know. That's enough information to get you to get the ball rolling. Now, the third bit of information, okay, and it's not something that you technically connect to, it's an optional piece of the equation here, would be which cube you want to use for your queries. When you're writing reports, when you're looking at charts, you're looking at a query, uh, I mean you're looking at a dashboard or a scorecard, behind the scenes a query is being issued from Excel, we'll just use that for the time being, to the end, you, to, to the analysis services database. Okay. Now a cube, let's just have a, a little refresher from chapter two. So a cube 
is tied to a specific subject matter. Like we'd have a sales cube, we would have a uh, customer tickets cube. And so all of the data in that cube, all of the queries that you would be able to run against that cube are related to that subject matter. A cube is comprised of measures and dimensions. I hope this is ringing a bell from chapter two when we covered the basics, the fundamentals here. And I'm just trying to give you a high level refresher. I'm not trying to replace the need for chapter two. Um, so if what I'm saying is really out of left field for you, you should go back and watch that. So let's we'll just kind of give this an idea here, just a reminder. Measures are numbers. They are the data you want to see. Another way to think about them, they are the answers to your questions. Okay. Well, you might ask a question, for example. How many sales did we make in Brazil in the year 2006? The answer to that question is a measure. It's a number, 6,245. Okay. That's the measurement you want to see. That's how you view success or view failure. That's the answer to your question. Dimensions are ways you want to view the measures. Okay. They are the people, places, things, uh, the adjectives, the descriptions. Um, they're generally not numerics. They're generally textual or date based. Uh, they are the context. They are the context for your answers. So when I ask that question, how many sales did we make in Brazil in 2006? What are the dimensions? Well, I asked you about 2006. Okay? I didn't ask you over all time or for every year over the past 10 years. But that's a dimension. Those are all dimensions. It's a way to look at the answer. Okay? I asked for a specific dimension member, 2006. That's a part of a time dimension. I also asked for a specific country. I asked for Brazil. We might also need to know China, US, England. Okay. Those are specifics. Those are ways of looking at that measure. Okay. So country, uh, year. Okay. That's a people place thing, an adjective, a way of looking at it. All right, you got that kind of with me? I know it's a quick little rundown, just a little reminder of what we're about to do because we're going to ask Excel to run all of these different queries up here okay? and we have to have a, at least a fundamental understanding of what the difference is between the measure and the dimension and then we have to know the database and the cube and that kind of stuff otherwise we run the risk of not connecting to the right thing, getting timeout errors, things like that. Okay, let's go into now Excel and talk about connecting. Okay. So I'm going to launch Excel 2010 here. And this is actually fairly simple to get started with this. Uh, once you've done it maybe three or four times, then it'll take you less than five seconds to get your connection set up here. So you're going to flip to the Data tab. And what you're looking for is you want to get data from other sources and you want to choose from analysis services and you can see it right in the name we're going to be connecting to a cube right? a database contains one or more cubes so let's go ahead and do that and it's asking us here what it says is the server name this is your analysis services instance so mine happens to be on the same machine that I'm on right now, so I can say localhost. Many times I've had to connect to IP addresses, uh, machine names, things like that in here. Uh, you're probably just, you're not likely going to need to change this right here. Uh, okay, what's the database? Notice right here that we only have a single database. We don't have many databases to choose from. So the single database right there, how many cubes are in this database? Two. You see, here's the optional little bit here. You had to know the instance, then you had to connect to that to get the list of databases. You have to choose a database, but you don't actually have to choose a specific cube. 
you can choose that in Excel later. Let me just give you a not so subtle hint. Check the box, pick the cube out. It'll make your life a lot easier. We're going to work with the Adventure Works cube. Now, up at the top, it's actually going to save a file. It puts it in your uh, My Documents, My Data Sources, and it saves it as an ODC. And you can see the name of the file, instance name, database name, and followed by cube name right there. So it kind of embeds the three pieces, the three major information bits you gave it in the file name. And it calls that an office database connection. And I actually have one, so it's probably going to ask me to overwrite that. Give it finish. Oh, it didn't. I guess I'd had that as a different name. Okay, let me just tell you, don't just say okay. Hey, the, the, you know, we get so used to once we say finish, we say okay, and we're out of that. This is an important little piece right here, and I want to make sure we spend enough time on it so that you get comfortable here. So what we're going to be starting with is a pivot table. We'll do charts here a couple of videos from now. Let's just stick with the pivot table for right now. Where do I want to put it? I want it to go right there. Now the important bit on here is this properties. In this properties you can get an understanding of what's going to happen when you add this pivot table to your Excel spreadsheet. Okay. Notice that the data we can have it automatically refresh, but that it defaults to not refreshing the data. That means that when you've made your query, you've dragged your data, you've put it on top of the Excel spreadsheet, it's not going to periodically go back to analysis services and update that data. It's a static data set there. Once you've made your pivot table, which to be fair, I haven't done that. You may not even be familiar with what I'm, I'm seeing yet. Uh, but just remember that the key thing is it's not going to go update that. But you can set it to do so. You can tell it, you know, once an hour, go back and refresh the data that's in this report. Or you can say every time I open this file, go back and refresh the data. Because it defaults to not doing that. Meaning that if I save this, it saves a static copy of this data. Okay, so just be aware of how that actually works. Now there's a couple of other little pieces, really the bottom two pieces down here that are very important to understand as well. Uh, let's talk about formatting. When we went through chapters 6 and 7, which I'm kind of assuming that you did not see, uh, that you weren't really part uh, of this, because um, if you had, you'd probably have skipped over. Uh, you'd have taken that chance earlier when I said to, it's okay to skip here. What we can do as the database designer, as the cube developer, as the BI architect, is we can specify that a measure has a specific format. I can say this is currency and it has a, uh, a dollar sign and we're putting commas as the thousandth separator and we're going to go down to only two decimal places. So that's my choice. And I'm storing that format on the server. Now that may seem okay, thanks Scott, <laughs> did really need to know. That's actually really important because that is not the way that most database systems will work. If you're working with a SQL server, a relational database, MySQL, Oracle, uh, Informix for example, you store a data type. You might say that this is money or currency but you don't specify that it's the a US dollar. You just say that it's a currency data type. But here in analysis services, when you are designing the database, you can specify the specific format. And the idea of that is that when your users go to create reports, they don't have to spend their time working with that. They don't have to waste five seconds going in and saying, nope, that's supposed to be currency and you know what, I want to round this to millions or I want this to have commas as the thousandths separator. So the default here of Excel is that it will use what analysis services tells it 
as the number format. And there's other things too. In analysis services, you can change, you can make things bold. You can make values in red when they're negative. For example, like a revenue or a gross profit. You can make it bold and in red. So Excel defaults to using those formats. And you can uncheck the boxes, but then you'd have to do all of that stuff yourself. So you probably want to leave it alone, but it's good to know what it means. If, finish with this and we'll continue on to this next section down here. If, when you start working with your cube at your office, if you didn't design it, if you find yourself always having to change it to currency or always having to change the negative values to red or to bold, go talk to the cube designer or the database designer. They can set it up in the cube that that number format is set automatically, that things are set to be read automatically. They can do that and it doesn't take that much work. All right. Let's take a look at this bottom one down here, this OLAP drill through. You know what drill through is, right? Where you have a hierarchy and you're drilling down the members of a hierarchy. This is simply asking the maximum number of records to retrieve when you go through the drill through. A thousand is a lot. You're probably not going to need to change that. Okay. So I'm going to say OK and OK again to place my pivot table into the report. And it's uh, you know kind of weird that I asked it to put it in A1, but it always puts it in A3. Uh, I don't know. But anyway, notice that when I'm working with a, a regular cell, nothing fancy about it. I don't get anything fancy up here. But when I click inside the pivot table, I get the pivot table tools. These guys come up. And I get the pivot table field list over here. Okay, so just having this is not enough. You have to actually click in it to get to what you're wanting to work with. Okay. Now, I tell you what, that's the basics of connections. Why don't we stop here? Let's come back in the next video, and let's actually start looking at this pivot table field list. Let's understand the labels and the values and how to build our pivot tables.